Hello, everybody. So, the most important idea that I've ever pitched in my career was in a field, and it was in a muddy pit near the M25. There were eight people standing in front of me, and these guys had good reputations. They were filmmakers from around the world, and um, so I gave them my very best pitch for the idea. Did as much as I could to sell it to them. And they stood there, and they were quite silent, a little bit deadpan. And they all naturally turned to the person that was standing next to me to see what he thought, because we knew that the opinion of that group would really ride on what, what he thought. It was Tom Cruise. And, sorry, did you catch that name drop? And <laughs> there's more coming, don't worry. And very slowly, he kind of lifted up his head, and he said, do you know what I think? This is awesome. This is entertainment. And with that lovely sort of broad smile that he's known for in his films. And frankly, at that point, I could have just hugged him because I was so <laughs> relieved as to what, what he'd said because it really could have gone either way. But the reason Tom responded like that was actually not just because the idea that I'd pitched was bold and it was exciting. It had loads of stunts and all kinds of cool stuff because if you're Tom Cruise, that's all in a normal working day uh, for him at the office, right? The reason he liked the idea was because it, was, it had what a lot of Hollywood filmmakers really look for as a really successful ingredient in films. It really looked, flew in the face of, of conformity. It took conformity and put it to one side and really was something that they were looking for that was fresh and a little bit rule-breaking. Um, the idea was very simple because up until that point, the way we used to market a lot of those movies, the, you know, even the really, really big ones, it was very, very simple. What we did was we basically showed people clips of the films and trailers um, and screenings. If people were really important and we wanted them on board, then we'd, you know, we'd get them onto the set and they'd be allowed to interview some of the cast. Uh, and this idea was very different to that. What we did is rather than showing people the film, we put people in it. And so we filmed a group of global journalists and YouTubers and content creators from all over the world and celebrities, and we put them in costume and makeup, and we made a scene from the film, one of the biggest battle scenes of the entire movie, and we put them right in it as the action hero. Um, and we really let it, let, allowed them to feel what Tom felt when he do, does his own stunts, because he's one of the very few Hollywood actors that actually does almost all of his own stunts himself. Um, and then we sent them out to go and promote the film for us. It really worked. Uh, we got about $5 million worth of coverage for that film all over the world. And interestingly as well, of course, they were so much more expression, uh, so much more passionate about the film, so much more excited, much longer pieces, so much more energy and passion, and because, of course, they felt part of the movie. We'd really allowed them um, to, to get to the heart of it. And with that, I learned, thank you, Tom, um, one really that important golden rule of Hollywood filmmaking. Establish what the rules are that everybody else abides by and chuck a hand grenade at it. Start all over again and completely go down a different path. And that really taught me something that day. Um, I've been very, very lucky to work on lots of really big, amazing, much-loved movies. I worked on most of the Harry Potter films, The Dark Knights, Joker more recently, Aquaman, the It horror movies right at the other end of the scale, um, the, uh, the, Ho the Hobbit films, the Lego movies, and I spent lots of my career trying to develop lots of these really incredible, bold, brave solutions to try and market these films in a slightly different way. Uh, but most importantly as, war, uh, uh, as well, I was able to have access to what really, frankly, was some of the most creative and inspirational brains around in the world. Uh, and I saw that there were so many different ways that their brains worked to develop those, those ideas. And that, to me, was incredibly interesting because I saw that these people that we all associate that are just in this kind of you know, Hollywood magical land are not in some voodoo bubble that the rest of us can't get into. The ideas and principles that they use to develop all of these creative ideas that wow us in Hollywood movies are actually incredibly simple, just like rule breaking. And the really, really good bit about all of this is that actually these things are so simple that we can actually use them in our own lines of work, in our own lives, in all sorts of different ways. And that's what I really want to talk to you about today. So with that, it's after lunch, a little bit of energy in the room. Who thinks they're creative? How many people in the room think they are creative? Okay, that's pretty good. 
That's about 15 to 20 percent. There's still about, oh, hang on, there's a few more coming here. So that's actually not bad. That's not bad. But I, thought, I've, I was kind of hoping for a bit more. We are in Oxford, after all. We're in the, one of the centers of intellectual brilliance in the world, right? But the point is, I think, that a lot of us don't think that we're actually particularly creative. Or even for those of us that do, we don't really think that it's actually part of the jobs that we do. So how do we bring all that creativity out? How do we be more like those big Hollywood movies and get all these inspir inspiring ideas out into the field? Here are what I think are my five top tips that I've learned from being around all of these amazing movies and all these incredible people that made them. Um, and I, think, I hope that these are things that you can directly and immediately apply to your jobs, your line of work, your daily life, whatever it might be. First up, now I know I will not be the first person to stand in front of everyone and say, happy places are good places to work. You know, we need to be happy to be able to work effectively, and um, the, the, you know, the workplace needs, needs to be happy, inspiring places. But with innovation and, and creativity, it is absolutely crucial. Um, and there are absolutely no better films that I ever went on than the Harry Potter films to be able to demonstrate this, because the reason for that was that it was all about the children. Because these enormous, great, massive movie sets full of kit and crews and people and scary cameras. And so they needed to make sure that regardless of what age you were, you could perform on camera. So they created these incredible, lovely, warm, embracive family atmospheres. And do you know what? That whole spirit pervaded throughout the whole company. The whole of Time Warner. We were all so proud to be the studio that was working on Harry Potter with that magical creativity. Um, and just look at the levels of creativity that that allowed them to produce. Yes, it made people relax on camera, but wow, it just made them just such inspiring places to be. Um, and I just, it, you couldn't help but just be wrapped up in all of that. In addition, of course, there's a mountain of scientific proof that tells us that we are genuinely much better when we're happier. It, apart from anything else, on a chemical level, it actually releases dopamine into our heads, which is the reward drug. And we know that that's been proven to help us focus and, be, uh, and, and, and get more out of our brains. On another level as well, it also allows us to access the subconscious part of our brain. And that, again, psychologists will tell you that that is where all of our ideas come from. Conversely, on the other side, it's almost impossible to be creative when we feel like we're under threat or we're scared of being shot down. And that certainly, from my perspective, that environment had a huge effect on me as well. Not just on the actors, it was all of us. I remember seeing the Hogwarts Express for the first time, and suddenly I thought, wow, this would be so cool on that point earlier of trying to put people into the film rather than showing it. Why don't we try and see if we can take some of these sets and stick it inside the train, and we'll take some of the cast and the animals and all kinds of other and costumes and props, and we'll tour them all over the, all, uh, internationally. I was very nervous because I remember arriving at Gardinor in Paris on the first day because, of course, it was a very expensive product, and I was still at a relatively early stage of my career. And I was very worried as to how this was all going to go down. So I asked one of the security guards, I said, you know, but how many people are here to come and see this thing? And he said, I've got absolutely no idea in a typically help, helpful way. And um, they, um, but he said, I can tell you that the queue to get on board is about one and a half kilometers long. And at that point, I started to calm down, and then it was all OK. <laughs> but so what does that actually mean? How do we, OK, great, Harry Potter, wonderful. They've got all this magic. They've got these incredible environments. How do we be more Harry Potter? Well, firstly, if you think about the fact that it's if stopping you from being creative is when you're scared. So try and leave people that you know are intimidating, those scary bosses, people that you might be, be, be with on a regular basis, that you know are not necessarily going to bring some positivity into the room. Try, wherever possible, to leave them outside of the room. Uh, threatening people are not really going to help your ide ideating process. But also, on a personal level, be encouraging yourself. Use words and vocabulary, vernacular. Your body language doing this is so much more important to be able to, he to help people develop ideas. Because another really great thing happens, that when you are welcoming, invite everyone else's ideas into the process, an incredible thing happens to your idea. It stops becoming my idea, and it becomes our idea. And suddenly, guess what? What idea is more likely to get taken up by the company and the colleagues that has the support of the colleagues around you? Because, of course, everyone, you're, when you're in a brainstorm, certainly in a business environment, is secretly thinking, how can I look good? 
how can my idea get to the forefront? How can, we try and, how can I try and put an idea across that's going to work? But when you build ideas in a room, it really helps strengthen them, throw them around, um, and develop them, um, and become, get stronger and stronger. I'd also start off the session with something fun to kind of get the ideas going. It's a little bit like we're coming on the speaker slot that's just after lunch when everyone's tired after having a nice sandwich. Um, but try and see if you can get, to, get a little fun exercise going to get those creative juices going. Um, and bring some of that, help bring some of that positivity and Harry Potter magic into the room. Next up, another quick question. Where were you when you last came up with a good idea? Shower. Where was that? Shower. Bed. Bed. Yes, very good. Asleep. Yes. Where? A who? Oh, on a walk, exactly, out getting exercise. Where have we not said? The office, the office. <laughs> get, get out of the office. It's really important. Those gray walls inside the office, those books that you've been pretending to read in front of the Zooms that you've been doing for the last however long, <laughs> to make us look more o Oxford and academic and all of those things get out of that. Honestly, breathing fresh air, changing your environment, it totally reboots your thinking. It's so simple and fundamental, but it's so easy. If you can make, even better, make the environment a bit relevant to the theme that you're thinking about, then so much the better. Um, so, but also, so have, if you have a look here, this is a film set. This is from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which is filmed in this country. And that little black outline there is Tim Burton. Uh, and he's known for his crazy, zany film sets. And um, he's known for lots of other crazy zany ideas as well. But what Tim is so brilliant at as well is by the, bringing those people onto those film sets, of course, it was so inspiring, a bit like, you know, The Train and Harry Potter. And so filmmakers are very, very clever like that. They use their film sets to try and get people to reboot their thinking. Now, sadly, I'm very conscious that not all of us can nip down to a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory set in our lunch breaks, but we can get outside. So next time you're doing some, ide some ideas, be it in your office, be it in whatever environment it is, try and change that environment. Get out onto a terrace if you can't get out of the office. If you do need to be in the office, try and make the room that you're in a little bit different. Maybe call it the greenhouse or the ideas lab. We used to call it creative cafe. Maybe try and put some of that fake sort of uh, grass on the, on the floor if you're going to call it the greenhouse. But change that environment a little bit. And also schedule that time during a lunch break or whatever it might be, to be able to really think about what you're th what, um, what the idea that you're trying to focus on. Most of us spend less than 6% of the working week actually thinking, and that's just not enough. It's pretty shocking, actually. The next tip is all about passion and bravery and commitment. To really see your idea through right from the early stages. And here's a really great example uh, of what I saw of, of some genuine bravery. This picture here is about the guy in the baseball cap, who's probably the least well-known. But just like all of the other guys that are in that picture, before the first Hangover movie came out, they were all pretty unknown. Possibly Bradley Cooper had a little bit of a profile. But the guy in the baseball cap is called Todd Phillips, and he was the director of the Hangover trilogy. They got into filming, and he realized that they needed about another $10 million to help with the production, to fulfill the creative vision that Todd had for the movie. And so he went to Warner Brothers and he said, I want that money. And they said, well, we'll give it to you, but you need a bigger star in the movie because these guys aren't well known enough. And we don't think we're going to get that money back. And he said, no, trust me, these guys have got it. They have absolutely got it. This film, by the way, came out of absolutely nowhere. We were not expecting it to be anything like the success that it was. And so he came back the next day and he said, okay, fine. By that point, Todd was actually, even though he wasn't that well-known, he was a very well-respected director. He'd done old school, and his, his director's fee would have been a very consequential sum. And he said, okay, I will, I will cut my director's fee, but I think it was about 90% or so, but it was down to an almost nominal level. But he said, that, you have to give me that $10 million, and I will, give, I will give back most of my fee as a demonstration of my commitment to help fund that $10 million. But when we get to the level of global takings and box office that you need to justify that extra money, from that point onwards, I want 15% of the net global takings. And Warner Brothers said, fine, okay, that's great. Once we've got to the level that we need for that money, fine, we'll still take 85%, you take 15, no problem. The Hangover was the biggest R-rated comedy in history. Todd's fee for that film was $70 million. 
And my last tip is all, think about the biggest movies. They don't just, very rarely are they full of just action heroes, a whole cast of action heroes. They've got lots of different personalities and characters in, in them um, that make them different and give them a richness and a storytelling and lots of different depths to it. Diversity is so important in so many areas of our lives at the moment, but in creativity and innovation, it is about so much more than race and ethnicity. It is about bringing people together that have all sorts of different perspectives and cultures and backgrounds and ways of thinking. Because, of course, we're all coming into those ideation sessions with our own preconceived biases and ideas. So include people from all loads of different backgrounds, from your customer base if you can, um, if you're in a business environment. Um, but think about all of those, the ways that you can shake up the thinking. A lot of people call people, some, some people that you can bring in from totally different areas of, of uh, uh, the topic that you're talking about that have no experience of that area. And that's a great thing. We call them sometimes uninformed geniuses or naive experts. It's those moments when you're like talking to someone. It could be a grandparent. And they suddenly ask you, why are you not doing something in a certain way? And you think, well, of course, we've thought about that. Actually, have we? Or maybe we have, but we need to go back to it. For, you know, we haven't thought we haven't addressed that for at least five years. And so people that sometimes our own experience and our knowledge and our understanding of our area holds back our thinking because we know what is likely to be accepted by the organizations that we're with. And it puts us what I call on these things, on train tracks of thought. It's where we stay in these safe areas of thinking where we're comfortable and we feel relaxed and we know that the risk level is low. And of course, to be really exponentially creative and get into the fresh stuff, we've got to get off those, out of those safe environments. So those five tips for creativity again. Number one, learn the rules and just chuck a rocket at them. Number two, Harry, creative happiness. Bring some positivity and inspiration into the room. Number three, get out, plunge, and refresh your thinking by rebooting with different environments. Number four, look at the idea boldly in the eye, because sometimes those ideas, some of the best ideas can be really scary. And lastly, shake it up with lots of new perspectives and stop your own experience and knowledge from, from limiting your thinking to stay in areas that are safe. Being boldly creative does come with all sorts of downsides to it, but the risk of being creative and shaking things up is so much lower than the risk of staying with the same bold, normal conformity and sameness. That's where the real risk is. Ask Hertz, ask Topshop, ask the hundreds of thousands of retailers across the world and other businesses that have gone sadly gone bust in the, last, uh, in the last couple of years because they didn't change and adapt quick enough. I think developing ideas is an exciting process. It's fun, it's enjoyable, and it's uplifting. And it makes our lives and our working places more fun to be. So why wouldn't we do that? Good luck.